In this video, Jordan Peterson compares the left and right hemispheres of human brain. And he was interested in why you have two hemispheres. Well, there's a bunch of things that you can say, broadly speaking, about the hemispheres, and I've written them, some of them down there. So the right hemisphere. This is an idealized representation of a relatively highly lateralized right-handed male. And the reason I'm saying that is men seem to be more lateralized than women, and the right-handed lateralization is the standard kind. But, you know, the brain can be lateralized all sorts of ways. You, what you might say is that... There's a bunch of ways of looking at it. One way you can look at it is that your cortex gets colonized by underlying structures. So, and that each underlying structure is likely to colonize a particular area. So, for example, when you, when you are born and you wake up and you see, your eyes are going to colonize your visual cortex, most likely, because it's sort of adapted for that. But if you don't have a visual cortex, then your eyes will colonize something else. So... So, that's, so the brain has proclivities towards a certain kind of structure, but especially early in development, it's unbelievably plastic. And so brains can be organized and lateralized in a bunch of different ways. But, so to simplify it, what you do is you kind of take, okay, well, let's take the, the kind of most straightforward and typical brain and talk about it as if it's the canonical brain. But I think what you can say is, regardless of where these systems are localized, they exist. So it's an oversimplification. Whatever. Doesn't matter. What you've got with regards to your cortices is a quick and dirty cortex, and that's the right hemisphere, and then you've got a long-term detailed cortex, and that's the left hemisphere. Left hemisphere is specialized for language. Language cuts things up into little tiny bitty pieces. You know, and that's really useful if you're doing little tiny bitty things, and you, you should be. Precision, right? Pinpoint accuracy. But that takes a lot of time and a lot of computation, whereas the right hemisphere says, yeah, yeah, let's get to the bloody point. You know, so it captures the thing in an image. So like the monster I showed you from the hippie cartoon, that's a right hemisphere thing. It's an image that represents a, a class of entities, and which, of course, images do. The right hemisphere looks like it's specialized for anomaly. Now, the way I look at it is this. Okay, so you've got your hippocampus down there, and it's keeping track of the comparison between what you want and what you think is happening. Bang! Something emerges. It's anomalous. You don't know what the hell's going on. And so you, you freeze. That's the motoric representation. Then you start to feel anxious. Then the right hemisphere comes up with some pictures. What might this be? You can experience this at home for your own enjoyment. Let's say you're home at 2 in the morning, and it's dark, and you're alone. Okay, and maybe you've watched a horror movie, so you're all nicely primed. You know, and then you hear a noise in another room, and that noise shouldn't be there. And so, you're going to go investigate, right? And so, let's say the door is just a little bit open, and it's dark in the room, and you have to put your hand in to turn on the light. It's like, you just watch what your imagination populates that room with. When you do that, it's like, you know, guy with axe, snake, alligator, like, whatever. But your right hemisphere is going... There may be one of this class of dangerous things in there. And what it's doing is basically coming up with a, with a hypothesis. What sort of monster might be in there? And you're all sort of freaked out about that, even though you know that, you know, who knows what happened, you know, nothing. Something creeped, but you're all, like, on edge. Because your brain doesn't work at night like it does in the day. And everyone knows that. Wake up in the middle of the night, it's like... All manner of horrors go through your imagination, and that usually happens when you're asleep. You're asleep for that most of the time, but sometimes you wake up and it's like you worry about everything. So anyways, so that's the right hemisphere. It's coming up with pictures of what might be there, and they're generally monstrous pictures, and the reason for that is, well, it's obvious what the reason for that is. You know, now, you'll probably turn the light on and look anyways, even though you might sort of peer around the corner, and then when there's nothing, you'll be embarrassed about how foolish you are. But, but you can see the instinctual behavior right there, and it's, it's wise. You know, there's a low probability that something terrible is there. But zero times, like, low probability times infinity equals large danger. So if there's a 2% chance that there's a killer in there, it pays to be, you know, a little on the tense side because being killed really sucks. And so you're, you're, you're primed to feel negative emotion more intensely, right? Because you're so vulnerable. So anyways, that's kind of what the right hemisphere is up to. It does quick and dirty representation. But it also does categorization. So it's not, it doesn't give you, 
exactly realistic representations of what's there. What it does instead is gives you categorical representations. And so you might say, how should you represent an unknown danger? You should use an amalgam of all known dangers to represent it. And that is what it is in a sense, you know, like that's why I talked to you earlier about the category of all dangerous things. So the Aborigines in Australia have this, this category which is women, fire, and dangerous things. It's like, well, you think, well, why are all those things in that category? It's like, well, it's not that hard to figure out if you think about it. But it's also a category that you very frequently see, say, in Disney cartoons. So the Wicked Queen, for example, in Sleeping Beauty... I mean, she's constantly bursting into flames and turning into a dragon, and no one seems to object to that. It makes perfect sense that the Wicked Queen would turn into a fire-breathing dragon. It's like, it doesn't make any sense at all. But, although it does, but, you know, it, it, it's not a rational transformation, but because it's in keeping with an archetypal structure, everybody goes, yeah, of course that's what she's going to do. And it happens all the time in Disney movies, like Ursula. Remember her from, from The Little Mermaid? She's trying to keep her daughter from becoming conscious. Yeah, nice mother, doing that. And she traps old Zeus, you know, she squeezes his soul to death and traps him in the underworld. Because he's also, well, we won't get into that. But anyways, what happens to Ursula is when you finally get her irritated enough, she grows into this huge ship-destroying storm monster that's part octopus, right? Or giant octopus. You think, well, that makes sense. Okay. <clears throat> it doesn't make a lot of sense. But it's a kind of hypothesis. Now, that's a representation of Mother Nature, red in tooth and claw. And there's also a reason that that's female. It's not female, it's feminine. It's actually a different thing. So, but we'll get to that. So, the right hemisphere, well, it's specialized for anomaly. It does quick and dirty analysis under the influence of the limbic system. It's not linguistic, so I would say it's still dominated by the subcortical systems. And my suspicion is that animals are still dominated by the subcortical systems. Their brains work from the bottom up. We have a top-down module, and that's, at least in part, the left hemisphere linguistic system. And it's a new thing that people have, and it's based on our capacity to abstract, so that would partly be visual, like hieroglyphic, and then also to transform things into linguistic form. And it seems to me that that's the part that we really identify as ourself, right? Because it's weird. If you're, let's say you're home alone, and you get freaked out, and all these images come to mind, you know... Do you think of those images as part of you? You think more, there are things, things that appeared to you. And that's what you think about your dreams. They're things that appeared to you, they're not you. It's like, why would you think that? I mean, they're, they're in your experiential space. Why is there that separation between you and your dream? I had a dream, not I thought up a dream, or look what I created. It's like, there you are, the observer, and up comes a dream. It's very, very weird. And, it, you know, it shows you that there are forces operating in your psyche that are impersonal, genuinely impersonal. And, of course, that's part of what Jung called the collective unconscious.